Mission Unusual Tokyo, the day Beirut exploded, and Mission in America's Pacific Northwest. All that and much more coming up next. Hello and welcome to Mission 360, I'm Gary Kraus. Today's program is coming to you from Portland, Oregon. And I'm actually in the heart of the city, in the Pioneer Courthouse Square, which has been nicknamed Portland's Living Room. Portland is the largest and most populated city in Oregon. In fact, nearly half of the population of Oregon lives in this city. Well, we're gonna be looking at Mission right here in Portland, but first up, let's travel to Beirut, Lebanon, to learn about that terrible explosion. It's a miracle, actually. It was a Tuesday afternoon, and Fatima El Kholi, a Syrian mom from Aleppo, had convinced a friend to change her plans for the day, not knowing how crucial that decision would be for them. At 6 p.m. of August 4, 2020, a gigantic explosion hit Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, leaving a large radius of destruction, taking more than 150 lives and leaving thousands injured. I was with my friend in Hamra Street. We had something to do. Then we decided to go shopping, but luckily we went to a store that had a basement. When the sound started, I thought the building was crumbling. People started screaming. There was panic. People were saying it was an explosion. My friend was screaming and running, but for me it was a different situation because I felt as if I was shocked. And when they said explosion, the bad pictures of the war in Syria crossed my mind. I was stuck, standing, and did not know how to walk. The sounds and feelings caused by explosions were sadly too familiar for Fatima. She had to leave her bombarded home back in Syria and find safety for her family in Lebanon a few years ago. Now, she works at the Adventist Learning Center, a school for refugee kids, impacting positively more than 450 refugee children since 2013. This is a center for learning. I teach the Arabic language and help with translation, but I see the center as more than a learning center. It is like a big home for children. We usually go and visit our students' parents, and most of the parents that live in the neighborhood of Burj Hamoud have very small houses, so children here have a bigger space to play, do activities, have fun, and go outside. In spite of Lebanon's current instability and the threat of COVID-19, the Adventist Learning Center was preparing to start classes soon. Fatima's friend was supposed to help get the classrooms ready that day. She was supposed to come with another lady to prepare the center for the new school year, but I convinced her to come with me instead. When we were there and the explosion happened, she was very scared and wished she hadn't come with me. But when we came here to the center and saw the damage, she was praising God that she was with me instead. Especially this classroom that we are standing in right now. This classroom has three tables for kids ages six and seven. When we came and saw the glass was shattered, I said, thank God the kids were not here because for sure there would have been injuries. The teachers and staff of the Learning Center believe God can make all things work together for good. I hope and plead to God to use His divine power, not only to fix the situation in our center, but also in Lebanon. Lebanon is a beautiful country, and I love it a lot, and I consider it my second home. God willing, everything will be fixed, and our kids here will have a new opportunity to have hope in life again and a good future. Our place here, like I said before, is more than a learning center. It's a source of love, optimism, and hope 
not only for us as teachers, but also for the kids and their parents. God willing, everything will be rebuilt and the situation will get better. My guest is Dan Howard, who is the marketing director for Portland Adventist Community Services. Dan, thanks for joining us. Of course. And this is quite a campus. I mean, this is a big operation. Can you describe that for our viewers, please? So Portland Adventist Community Services started in 1934 and has been building in size ever since then. Um, you know, it started off as more of a typical uh, Adventist community, community service center with um, some of the local church ladies making clothes and quilts and things to give people during the Great Depression. Um, it's grown out since then and now we have three branches. We have the food pantry which gives out millions of pounds of food every year to the community members, to tens of thousands of families. And then we have our low-cost thrift store which provides goods and home goods to people that otherwise wouldn't be able to afford them even from other thrift stores. We keep our, our prices much lower um, so that people can, can come and outfit their homes and, and clothe their kids and all that sort of stuff for um, you know, a very reasonable amount of money. And then we have a, a safety net dental clinic that gives preventative dental care to community members that wouldn't otherwise be able to because of um, being underinsured or, or you know, below the poverty level. Um, it's a place that they can go and they can get cleanings and they can get crowns and they can get things that wouldn't normally be accessible to them through emergency dental care. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, when I think of Pacific Northwest, I'm thinking of actually quite affluent circumstances with expensive housing and whatnot, but what you're telling me is there's still a demand for community services? Yeah, there's a huge demand. We call, there, there's a demographic that we call the working poor that are people who have jobs, sometimes two or three or even four part-time jobs, um, all at minimum wage, and they still can't afford to have things like insurance can't you know they get to the end of the month and they're running out of grocery money mm. um, those are primarily the people that we see in our food pantry every day um, there's also a huge homeless population in Portland that has grown over the last few years um, from people coming here whether it was for social services that were available or just more temperate weather from where they were or whatever it, it's become a um, kind of a hub for, for homelessness and because the housing prices are so high, um, yeah, you do have a very big gap between the more affluent and the people that, that really need us. So we find that there's uh, far too much need. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, that uh, we partner with a lot of community service organizations and different churches, different um, you know social uh, you know folks around Portland that are all trying to just help people where they can. So. Wonderful. Now, it's Adventist Community Services. How, how would you describe the, the mission of the, of the community services? So we want to share Christ to people by ministering to them and giving them dignity. Primarily, we, we want to be able to minister to them body, mind, spiritual. Um, be able to give them the, the feeling of just having someone be kind to them. Like honestly, since we've opened the dental clinic, the, the, the feedback that is, has struck me the most is people just coming in and saying, not even thank you for the service or thank you for my teeth or thank you that I don't have toothaches anymore. Literally just saying thank you for being kind to me. Um, when I go to these other places and when I go to you know government agencies and stuff, I'm just treated like second-class citizen I'm treated like trash and here you smile and you answer my questions and you make me feel like I'm actually a human being again um, you know that's that's huge and that's a big part of, of our mission it's just making people feel like they're human that they deserve to be um, to be happy and to, to have the basics in life mm. um, that's that's our ministry to people it's very very based on, on, on it's not it's not typical evangelism it's filling their needs it's making them feel like a human again which is how Christ did his thing on, on earth it's just going around and making people feel like they were special mm. 
So what you're describing to me here is, is a holistic mission where you're not just coming to preach at people, mm -hmm. but you're wanting to show the love of Jesus. Yeah. Absolutely. And the word that comes up in our conversation quite a bit in the last half hour is dignity. That is, our, that is our primary focus, is that we want to give people the feeling of dignity. We want them to feel like they are not being given charity, that they are deserving of, of um, being able to feed their families, being able to clothe their families, um, and to help them along with that. Not necessarily just to hand it to them. It's a, it's a thrift store. Like They come in and they pay, but we keep the prices manageable. Um, it's a food pantry, and they come and they get food, but it's not enough for the whole month. You know, they can come once a month and they can get some boxes and stuff. But then a lot of them end up coming and volunteering. Um, you know, we have people coming and doing their community service here, and our volunteer army is, is hundreds of people strong that come and keep all of this up and running. And uh, so there's there's just multifaceted ministry happening everywhere um, here. And I, it's, it's been amazing and life-changing to be a part of it. Wonderful. What's your hope for the future for the sender? I would love to see our dental clinic grow and get more established. Um, it was delayed because of COVID. We just couldn't afford the protective uh, stuff that we needed to have volunteer dentists come and stand over someone's mouth, which is how COVID is transmitted. Um, so it, it sort of was delayed in its opening and, and we're kind of on the, the knife's edge right now of getting everything up and going and getting volunteers and and so I'm really excited to see that built out. And I would also love to see more mental health services provided. We have a, a chaplain now that we have hired um, on staff that uh, tends to the volunteers and the staff and, and clients that come in and need spiritual guidance, but he also has a master's in social work and he can, he can give regular mental health counseling and recommend counseling and, and services in the community. And I would love to see that built out more because the people that we serve often don't have those resources. Wonderful. Dan, thanks so much for sharing with us today. Thank you. And it's wonderful to see another example of Christ's method of ministry being put into practice in an urban area. We'll be right back after this break. Next up, a Nepalese Bible worker working in America's Midwest. Hello viewers at home, thank you so much for joining us for another interview and story about people doing mission around the world. Uh, today I have my good friend with me, Philip, and we've met many years ago, but it's been a while since I've seen you, Philip. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing here in Kansas City and what the ministry is. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, as you mentioned, I work here at Kansas City area. Um, basically, I work with the refugee people, uh, the refugees that come from the different parts of the world, like Nepal, from Bhutan, from uh, Myanmar, and some other countries of Africa. So my work is to work with them, whatever help that they need, I am there and uh, you know uh, the, to show the love of God to them. Now you are from Nepal. I right? am from Nepal, that's correct. And you were doing work in Nepal and then somehow you got connected with uh, Kansas City and ministry here in Missouri. How did that happen? Yeah, as you said, I am from Nepal. I was born in Nepal. I was born in a Hindu family. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was one man, a missionary man. He introduced us to Christ. And then, uh, you know, we became Christian. We became Adventist after that. And God opened the door for me to go to Mexico. I went to Monte Morales to study. I was there for five years. And I, well, as I was studying there, I heard that there are so many Nepalese people here at Kansas City and in this uh, part of the uh, part of the world. And uh, our p conference president, Dean Quaid, and he contacted me. He said there are so many Nepalese speaking people over here. And I said, wow, I want to be part of it. So I traveled here every summer while I was studying at Monte Morelos. And uh, that's how I came to know about this work. And I started working here. 
and I love working with uh, Nepali people here because you know I think that I was in their place at some point I did not know Christ I was from different religion and one missionary came to me and he introduced me cr to Christ and that's what I want to do to these uh, people that I want to give them opportunity to know about one true God so now you're in the place of that missionary that reached you as a Hindu believer to become Christian so that you can reach out to those truly now one of my favorite things that I get to hear about happening here in Kansas City is your guys' Pathfinder Club that you've started called NC for Y or New Change for Youth and that started reaching out to the community of, of Nepalese refugees and all of them being Hindu but pulling them into a Pathfinder Club so essentially you had a Hindu Pathfinder Club True. tell me a little bit about that <laughs> yeah so when we first came here uh, like you know we did not really know how to start and, and where to like start the work and all of a sudden we realized that there are so many kids around the apartment complexes and we said wow why not start a, a, a program for the youth uh, for the kids you know and in the first summer we started VBS and then the, so many people came together so many young people came together and after that we thought what if we organize a pathfinder club where we could bring these young people because they are uh, in a place where they are in danger to you know make a bad decision so let's give, me a, give, give them a platform to to be in, in a pathfinder club and learn about jesus so you are right we formed a pathfinder club so in that pathfinder club uh, uh, most of them were hindu uh, some of them were Christian but from different background so we started and we started working with them and as a result that small we started with Nepali speaking Pathfinder club and that grew and so many other kids started coming and that ha now it has become a multicultural international Pathfinder club where we have the kids from more than nine countries wow. that come together and, and learn uh, about Jesus. Some of them have taken baptism, some of them now has become Bible, Bible workers, wow. uh, and some of them have decided to go to Adventist school and learn and get a Christian education. That's incredible. Yeah. So you're telling me that from all of these kids being Hindu, Nepalese, other refugees from around, you guys just pulling these kids now through a Pathfinder Club, they're becoming Christian, they're becoming Adventists, they're getting to know Jesus through the schools, through the Pathfinder events. That's that's correct. And not only that, when they started coming to Pathfinder, uh, you know, they started to know about the true God. And now they are the one who are taking the leadership role. Wow. And they are the one who are reaching out to the community. Now they want to reach out more kids. That they, Some of them are giving Bible studies now. Uh, they are give, uh, doing the visitations and doing the mission work so when they first came to the pathfinder uh, nc4y new change for youth pathfinder club that we had they came as somebody new they did not have any uh, any any background any knowledge but when they learn about god and they said you know what we want to do this so now they are the one who are taking the leadership uh, role and going back to the community and actually we have and because of the pathfinder we started a church and we have a uh, church over here uh, and most of the people that attend to the church are young people mm -hmm. and the teenagers that's awesome so because of all of this happening what would you say to people who are watching maybe who may be interested in starting a pathfinder club or, or looking at different like ministries that they may feel is just a small deal but then clearly from this story, you guys have had an enormous impact on the refugee groups here in Kansas City. What would you say to people who are thinking of starting their own ministries in order to reach out to refugees? Yeah, from my experience, you know, what I have learned is go out and reach the people where they are, you know, because we came here, we did not know what to do. So we went to the apartment complex, we knocked to the doors and we said, hey, we are here, uh, what help can we be, you know? And as we went into the place, uh, as we reached them where they were, you know, there are so many needs. So I will tell them, I will say them, you know, uh, take a small steps, go out, uh, even a small act like playing with them in the playground that will make a huge difference a small act like you know if they are needing help with uh, uh, you know the right to their app uh, uh, to their appointments or uh, you know uh, reach them where they are that will make a difference so just be Jesus to them just have a True, relationship yeah. and take care of their needs and help them along their daily lives that's correct I love that well Philip thank you so much for talking with me it's wonderful to see you again we met in Nepal 
and now we're in Kansas City still doing ministry together. Amen. So thank you so much for your continued work here. And viewers at home, I hope this motivational to understand what different types of even small ministries can make a huge difference with refugee populations, with uh, immigrants, with people who aren't Christian, that just the small things can show them the love of Jesus and then they'll understand that they want to follow this Jesus. So thank you for viewing and I hope you enjoy this next mission story. Welcome back to Portland, Oregon. And next up, we traveled to Japan, to the city of Tokyo, to get an update on the Mission Unusual Tokyo project. Cities throughout Northern Asia, like Seoul, Taipei, Tokyo, and Ulaanbaatar, are home to millions of people who have not heard the gospel message. Reaching these vast cities seems daunting, and the work in sensitive territories is even more difficult to measure. Not even 1% of the 230 million people in the Northern Asia Pacific region are Seventh-day Adventists. Despite the challenges, Adventists pray for opportunities to share the light of Jesus in this territory. The Adventist Church in Japan invited the General Conference and the Northern Asia Pacific Division to partner with them to create Mission Unusual, a massive church planting and disciple making movement. Since Tokyo is the world's largest city, this movement is an ambitious effort. Working closely with local Japanese church leaders, a team of church planting missionaries is on the ground, learning the language and deciding how best to share Jesus with the Japanese. The three missionary couples spend hours each day preparing themselves for the work within central Tokyo. It's not just the population size that makes outreach hard. There are many barriers to religion too. The Japanese society is largely secular and many people adhere to Eastern philosophy. Another challenge is overcoming the isolation of the older generation. Reaching out to them and showing them compassion can be tricky. Missionaries like Yuri and Lais have been creating connections with their neighbors. Simple tasks like shopping, visiting the local park, and practicing their growing Japanese vocabulary with strangers on the street are all opportunities to connect. The missionary team gathers each Sabbath to pray, study God's word, eat, laugh, share challenges, and seek the Holy Spirit together. Aya is a great example of a local church member who has taken the spirit of mission unusual to heart. She uses her home as a place of ministry, especially for parents and kids. Some have been introduced to the Bible for the first time in her living room. Others have even requested prayer for their families. Amazing things are happening in Tokyo. With time, the ministry team will grow as plans are made to bring in global mission pioneers, urban centers of influence, volunteers, and tent makers in the future. The challenge of ministering to the world's largest city can sometimes seem like too much but God's power can overcome all barriers. We ask that you continue to pray for the Mission Unusual Church Planting and Disciple Making Movement. Pray that the Adventists here will continue to develop new creative ways to build connections with those around them. Thank you for supporting the mission offering, which fuels work like this. sunlight, the poetry and laughter, hostile in the desert, but somehow I'm not alone.
longes de ti O deserto cruel Fez que eu aprendesse a ser feliz Well, thank you so much for joining us on today's program. And I hope that you've been challenged and inspired by our 360 degree view of mission around the world. And we've seen many challenges. We've seen the Mission Unusual Tokyo Initiative, a tremendous challenge reaching the largest city in the world. But we see that there are missionaries coming together. We see global mission pioneers being planned, volunteers, urban centers of influence, a holistic approach to mission, working with the local pastors, leaders, and church members there in Tokyo. We think of Beirut, Lebanon, what a tremendous challenge. And I wanna thank you so much for your continuing support for Global Mission, your support through your prayers, through your donations, and also your personal involvement in mission. It does make a difference to frontline workers to know that there is a world church that is praying for them. Well, for Adventist Mission, I'm Gary Krause, and I hope that you can join me next time right here on Mission 360.